here at Kilrenny, no matter who you are, how many times or how few times you've been here, whether you're here in person or watching on, uh, online later, you're all equally welcome in God's house. A few intimations to start with this morning. Uh, Book and Jigsaw Cafe every Wednesday afternoon, 2 till 4 in the church hall. It's an opportunity for everyone in the area just to come together, have a cup of tea, coffee, cake. Uh, I don't know why I mentioned cake, but just in case you need an incentive, cakes. I've, I've tasted the cakes, I do quality control occasionally, all good. Um, it's not just for church members, it's for anyone in the community. So please do encourage people to come uh, along and enjoy, and join that. Um, Margaret Gray is making up the flower list for this year. We'd be grateful if you would let her know uh, if you want to contribute flowers for the church. We will have a joint meeting of the cup sessions of Kilrenny King's Band's Lab Award at Can B uh, here in Kilrenny on Saturday the 25th of February uh, at 10.30am. Elders, please note that. A couple of other things. Early Cancer Care Association. This is a monthly group that's restarting for 2023. It might be of interest to anyone you know. It's come together to support patients and their families who have at some point experienced uh, cancer. All meetings are held on a Thursday in Buckhaven Theatre in Buckhaven, 1.30 to 3pm. The first meeting will be on the 23rd of February. St Mark's Church in St Andrews, you would probably know better as Hope Park and Martyrs, opposite the bus station runs a cafe and a warm space every Friday between 11.30 and 2pm offering soup, good company and a warm welcome. If you're in St. Panos on a Friday, I'm sure you will be very welcome. Before we get to the serious stuff, I hope you all enjoyed yesterday afternoon's event. <laughs> uh, I look after my voice when I go to Murrayfield these days. I don't shout, but others may not have quite the same voice they normally do. And I know that uh, it wasn't just Liz and I who were at Murrayfield on Saturday either, so uh, very good, nice. It, I don't know, there's something nice about something nice happening for once um, in amongst all the doom and gloom. But I do have to turn to serious matters. This Sunday and next Sunday, we will have a retirement collection for the disaster relief efforts in Turkey and Syria. I'm sure you've been as horrified as I have been and, and many, many, many others around the world. But the destruction and devastation that the earthquake and the aftershocks have caused. I heard in the radio this morning it's now 28,000 people who have died in the immediate aftermath. Some of you, I'm sure, have been to Turkey on holiday, and while you might not know that particular region, you will know the country and the people. Um, all of us, I think, share that sense of disbelief that something could happen on such a scale in Europe. But it can and it has. The Church of Scotland has set up an appeal on behalf of congregations right across the country asking if we are able to donate and at the moment it seems that money is actually the most effective form of donation rather than trying to give stuff which can be a bit random and difficult to manage. So the Church of Scotland are donating through the aid to local churches in the area in Turkey and northern Syria. So please, if you're able to put something in the plate after the service or bring something along next Sunday or speak to our treasurer Dave uh, Thompson and he will uh, advise you what the best course of action might be. We will have a specific prayer for the situation which I'll use during the service but I know many of you will be praying for the people most affected and will continue to do so in this, through the service and in the days ahead. So please, while it may seem sometimes these things happen a long way away, this is on our own doorstep. 
much like the conflict in Ukraine, these are people and places we know well. If you're able to help, that would be appreciated. As always, please join us for tea and coffee after the service in the, in the church hall. Let us come and worship the Lord. Lord, in a world of chaos and uncertainty, we come to worship you. Asking you help us to make sense of all that we see and hear. When we see natural disasters and human injustice, we are confused and upset. Help us now, Lord, to put these situations into your hands and give our minds peace that we might then be better placed to offer support when we are able to do so. So, Lord, grant us calmness for a short while. Allow us these moments of restoration. Strengthen us and give us courage so that we may return to the world of way to serve and support those you send us to. Amen. Let us begin our worship in hymn number 36, God is our refuge and our strength. We can communicate on social networking sites with people around the world, 
but fail to know the names of our neighbours. We struggle to say hello to the stranger in our midst at church or in our community. God of communication, you've spoken to us through the course of history in a rapidly changing world of communication. Open our eyes to the present, to be present to the humans in our midst, welcoming strangers as friends, turning neighbours into community. In the busyness of our lives, may we take time to be still, to listen, to know that you are indeed a communicating God. And now let us join our voices together with believers around the world in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sometimes when you make a service up, you have very fixed ideas as to what you're going to do and what you're going to sing. And it was about a month ago we were singing a hymn that was on the other side of the page from this particular hymn. And as we're singing it, my eyes doing that thing that you sometimes do, you're wandering down the page next to the one you're actually looking at. And I think to myself, why did I pick that hymn? So, unfortunately, not having David here today, we'll just, we'll just have to give it a go and see how it works. But I thought to myself, that looks like an interesting hymn, we must try that sometime. And I left myself a little note, which is unusual for me, because normally I forget things very quickly. And so, we're going to sing hymn 486. You can blame a wandering eye that you're now having to try this one out because I don't think we've sung it before. But we'll give it a bash. We can't do a, 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 a practice run because we're on the box today, but see how we do. So 486, forgive our sins as we forgive. <coughs> Egypt, 
by the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them, or worship them, for I am the Lord your God and a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work. And the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, or daughter, nor your manservant, or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all in them that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, so you may live long in the land the Lord God, your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife, or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. When the people saw the thunder and lightning, and heard the trumpet, and saw the mountain and smoke. They trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you. So the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained in the distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites this. You have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from, the heaven, from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of, gods of, gods of gold. Here is the first reading. So we sing again from the hymn book number 715. Behold the mountain of the Lord. 715.
Second reading is in Exodus 34, chapters 27, verses 27 to 35, on page 94. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights, without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called for them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near him and gave him all, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given them on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses put the veil back over his face and he went in to speak with the Lord. Here in the second reading. Thank you, John. <coughs> Normally at this point in the service I would have our prayers for peace and we will have prayers for peace, but peace of a slightly different kind today. This week the prayer I'm going to use comes from the moderator of the General Assembly and it's focus is on the earthquake aftermath in T Turkey and Syria. It's a prayer for peace of a different kind, but still in an area that suffered major conflict as well as this natural calamity. As we pray for those caught up in the earthquake and its aftermath, let us also pray for all places of conflict, deprivation and natural disasters as well as man-made disasters. Let us pray. O oh God, who in Christ knew the challenges of life, particularly in Western Asia, let the people there know your love. In Turkey, Syria and Lebanon, uphold the injured the traumatised. Bless those rescuing, helping and supporting, that they may have the energy and resilience to keep going through adversity, and help as many as possible to survive. We pray particularly for our partners in the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon. Those who have faced so many, many challenges recently, we continue to pour out love and support to all in need. From their little they have been giving their all. Help us to know how we may support them. We give thanks for the memory of all who have died and pray for their families and friends as they grieve their loved ones. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us sing again in the hymn of all for a closer walk with God, 552. Five,
acceptable in your sight, God. Amen. For those of you just here today, we've been following the book of Exodus, the story of Moses, for the last few weeks. And today we reach that climactic point in the book of Exodus, the receiving of the Ten Commandments. The story is told in two parts, it's not just about the law being delivered to the Israelites, but it's also about a changing relationship between God and his people. You'll recall that I've been highlighting the parallels between the story of the Exodus, that moment when the Israelites left Egypt, and the period of exile in Babylon, when biblical scholars believe these stories were actually written down. The difference in time between the writing, them, writing of them and the period they were said to have taken place is at least 500 years, but could well be much longer. So time takes on a strange quality when you read today's passages. Let me take a simple example of what I mean. After the escape from Egypt, the Israelites had been travelling for three months, we are told. They had reached the area of Mount Sinai in the Arabian Peninsula. Now, despite the best efforts of scholarship, we cannot be certain where they were. But the best guess is that they were down on the eastern tip. If you can, in your mind's eye, see that little inlet, inlet up the Egyptian coast of the sea, Red Sea, and then a chunk of land known as Sinai, before you get across to the main part of the Middle East. They were down on the extremity of that part of the map. I should have brought a map with me today. But it probably, even stood out here with a big map, it's still going to be difficult to see. You have to use your imagination. We cannot be sure where they were. But given the number of people that the Bible tells us were trying to move through the desert, they must have covered far more ground than we think is possible in order to reach that point. Either that or the journey took much longer than the three months we are told. In chapter 20 we have Moses delivering the commandments to the people, but in chapter 32 we have a scene where Moses is speaking to God at Mount Sinai and getting them again. It turns out, apparently, that in the 40 days that Moses had been away speaking to God on the mountain, the people had lost all faith. And they had turned to another god. They created a golden calf in order to worship. So time, as I say, becomes very elastic around this period of the story. You can't really imagine that in 40 days the Israelites lost all faith in the god that had taken them from Egypt and created the miracle of the crossing of the Red Sea and so forth the feeding of them in the desert, all the other things that went with it. What's much more likely is some folk memory and some projection of more recent history in Israel's life. What's probably being projected back into ancient history is the much more recent events of the period of King Jeroboam in the first book of Kings. That features so heavily in the decades of disbelief of the Jewish people before they were sent in exile to Babylon. And what we have within the story of Exodus in so many ways is a bit of parallelism of the Jewish people recognising their unfaithfulness, but instead of just leaving it in recent history, projecting it much further back in time, so then they can learn a lesson from that and the, the re-establishment of the relationship with God. The Jewish leaders, religious leaders, trapped in Babylon, in exile, had a sense that they needed to capture their history. They needed to capture their teachings. They needed 
capture everything in writing before the people lose <coughs> their identity entirely. It's so easy when you've been taken from your homeland to just adapt. We see it so often. We demand it. Receiving populations demand that the people coming into the midst adapt to the new circumstances. Well, they should just believe what we believe. That's, they've come to us. They need to take on our beliefs. And we see this in modern times as well as in ancient times. The Jews knew they had a special place in God's heart, but they needed to really capture all of that to ensure they could keep it. And so what we have is this conflation of time, of recent history being projected into the past, the deep past, the far distant past, so that you can then help the people see what's been going on, the much longer degradation of the relationship with their God. It's hard to believe that within 40 days you give up on something or someone. It's much more likely you'd hang around for a lot longer in order to see what's going to happen. And the events are dramatic. Whatever we say in terms of these histories, there's a folk memory coming from the deep past through the Jewish uh, awareness of who they are to that present time. And then we get to the set piece. And there's some wonderful, I said last Sunday, you know, some cinematic moments in the Bible. And this is one of those. Moses coming down from the mountains with the tablets of stone. It's the stuff that Hollywood loves. It's the stuff we can all imagine in our heads. The smoking mountain, the glowing figure of Moses, and these two great blocks of stone that he's carrying. And then, of course, the first thing that happens, he smashes them to pieces because of the people's unfaithfulness. So he has to return and do the job all over again. It's great stuff. It's a great set of images. And we should hold on to those. But the Ten Commandments are not simply a set of rules that God had put out of the air. And again, this maybe reflects on the later time when all of this has been written down that people recognised that there were certain rules society had to follow in order to remain stable. So we find that the Ten Commandments in Judaism and later in Christianity are just as important in so many other societies, be they faith-based or be they secular. They form the basis of good governance. The philosopher Thomas Hobbes, writing in the 17th century, um, around the time of the English Civil War, described what he called the state of nature, humans living without rules, as nasty, brutish and short. Because if there are no rules to control how we relate to each other, then when we need something, we just go and grab it from someone else, and vice versa and all this chaos. Long before Hobbes wrote these words in the 17th century, a time of chaos in English history, in fact in British history, because the English Civil War was not just an English affair, it was very much a Scottish affair as well. The Bible had offered solutions to the same problem. How do we stop chaos? We need a set of instructions. The Ten Commandments are part of that. They offer a guide for life in all human society. And those who successfully followed them lived a better life as a result. Their importance cannot be overstated. And even in a world today, even though we have adapted some of them, the essence of the Ten Commandments remains crucial not just our legal systems, 
but to the way we relate to each other on a daily basis. They're as important to us now as they were the day that Moses brought them down from the mountain. The final point I want to make this morning is this idea that the relationship between God and his people was changing. This marks a point in time where things start to change between God and his people. Up to that point he had led them through the desert either the column of smoke or the column of fire. I missed out large chunks of Exodus because I didn't feel you needed to know the particular dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant or the tent of the Lord's presence. They're very detailed. If you feel the need, read them for yourself. It's fascinating stuff, but not good for a Sunday morning. Said James John, I think, would have cursed me uh, quite mightily if I made him read how many cubits of this and lengths of that and so on and so forth. Uh, although, maybe for your engineer's case, that might work quite nicely. You might have enjoyed yourself. <laughs> Lots of detailed instructions about the tent of the Lord's presence, about the building of the Ark of the Covenant. And God would then inhabit that space from then on. The column of smoke and the column of fire disappear. God's no longer leading his people in a very visual sense, but rather is with his people. In the midst, as it were. That's a remarkable change in so many ways. This God who had been so distant prior to the events of the Exodus now was literally dwelling with the people. It changed that despite all of the mistakes the Jews had made, despite all of the things the Israelites had got wrong, God still was willing to live with them in their community as part of them. One strange aspect of this story is the appearance of Moses after each time he'd spoken with God. The scriptures tell us his face glowed for many days after these meetings, whether on the mountain or later in the tent of the presence. It was such an intense sight for the Israelites that they requested Moses cover his face as soon as he had told the people what God wanted them to know. Moses then seems to have spent most of his time wearing a veil to hide his, this intense glow. Something of this nature, this memory, must have been handed down through the generations and marked Moses out as being special, a messenger directly from God. And if you read through the Gospels and so many other books of the Bible, you will come across characters from time to time who have this glow, this intense uh, light around them, whether the angels or at times the transfiguration which is coming up quite soon that Jesus and Moses and Elijah spoke in the mountaintop. They were surrounded by this glow. So it seems that Moses by this time had very much become the leader of the people and the people knew it. Remember a few weeks ago, this is the same man who stood before the burning bush and said, God, I don't have the words for this. I can't speak. I stammer and I stumble all the time. And you want me to lead all these people? I can't do that. And the argument that went back and forth, now we have this man who is physically changed, who is part and parcel of God's mission, leading a whole nation of people. Going from being that stumbling, stammering man who didn't want to speak and in the end his brother spoke for him to becoming this leader of people. One of the greatest in human history. My final point, I want to return to the Ten Commandments for a second. I said this is to form the basis of our legal systems and in so many ways, if you read the Ten Commandments, they are simple, they're straightforward. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not uh, steal. All of these are simple, straightforward things. But we know they're not. Ah, oh, but. You hear it all the time. Oh, but what happens if, you know, the door was open, I 
didn't actually trespass, the door was already open. So I just wanted to see what was the other side. You start getting this, and Judaism, certainly by the time of its writing, had become a very legalistic religion. It lacked the simplicity of its beginnings. It lacked that sense of it's clear, it's black, or it's white. And it seems, by the time of the time of Jesus' day, that Judaism had become much more about tripping people up and making them make mistakes rather than this simple, straightforward, here are the rules, obey. But rules are simple and easy. The more complex they become, the more exceptions there are, the more nuances, the harder it becomes to follow them. Jesus came and swept all of that away and brought the people back to the simplest of principles. When he was asked which was the most important of the commandments, he responded as follows. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. I covered a great deal of ground this morning and a number of challenging themes, but I want to finish on that note. Love God with all your heart, love your neighbour as you love yourself. That, to me, sums up to the Gospel message and gets to the very essence of everything we should be about. Those moments in Mount Sinai when the Ten Commandments were delivered weren't about Clause 3, Paragraph 4, uh, item 2, in this particular set of circumstances, you know, that's not what these commandments were about. They were simple, they were straightforward, they were to the point. And Jesus returns us to that simple, straightforward message. Love one another, love God, with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your might. So simple, so straightforward, and yet sometimes so difficult, but we try. Amen, and may God add his blessing to these words. We are going to sing that particular commandment, and it's on your order of service. A new commandment I give to you, and we'll sing it through twice. So. If there's a slight hesitation with the box at the end of the first run through, don't worry, Dave's doing everything he can to keep us on track. Uh, but stay seated and we'll sing together. A new commandment I give to you.
Let us come together with our prayers for the world. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we bring our offerings to you for dedication, we bring it ourselves as well, to be your eyes and ears, your hands and feet, serving and praising your name in all we do. Bless us and bless our offerings that we may in turn be a blessing to you. Lord, as we pray, we hold in our hearts all those affected by the catastrophic earthquake in Turkey and Syria. We think not just of those in the immediate region, but so many more who live around the world feeling helpless and fearing for relatives and friends. Be with them and give them a sense of your presence and your peace. Blessed are you, Lord God, giver of life and creator of love. We give thanks and praise for the light of each day and for the light of the gospel as revealed in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We rejoice in the life that you give us, and we delight in your presence. <coughs> Blessed are you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we give thanks to the light of Jesus Christ, we ask that this light may shine in our lives and in the whole of the church. We ask your blessing on all who proclaim the gospel and teach the world. We pray for those who are seeking to revive and promote faith in you and your love. May the church grow in love, in witness, and in number. Lord God of light, scatter the darkness from our world. We ask your blessing upon rulers, rulers, rulers and leaders who have difficult decisions to make concerning the world and who are often not sure which way to turn. We pray for all who work to bring freedom and justice to all people. For those who seek to support the poor and care for the oppressed. We pray for those who feel that they are working in the dark and unable to find their way. Lord, we ask that all darkness be dispersed from our hearts and our communities. May we help to bring your light and life to our homes and to all our relationships. We ask your blessing upon our families and friends and upon all whom we work or play with. And now, Lord, in the silence of our hearts, we bring before you all those we know of in need of your care, your comfort, your compassion, and your love at this time. Lord God of light, scatter the darkness from our world. We give thanks for the fullness of eternal life. We ask your blessing upon our loved ones who have entered into the fullness of your kingdom and all the faithful departed. We pray for the day when we might see you more clearly and walk without fear in your light. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us close our worship this morning with Him 110. Glory be to God the Father. One, one, two.
shall rejoice, as all is made complete. In hope be strong, all life be friend, and kindly tend creation storm. These things we ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 